Hello, everyone, and welcome to Harass's extraordinary meeting on the United States of America and this special plenary titled Latin America and the United States Strengthening a Natural Partnership. By way of introduction, my name is Stephen Melnick. I'm the founder of political and business diplomacy.org, an organization that assists country leaders achieve their economic and political goals globally. I'm also a tenure professor and programs director at City University of New York, Baruch College, Zicklin School of Business, the largest business school in the United States. And last but not least, I proudly serve as honorary board member of two very important nonprofit organizations, Liberland Aid Foundation and Global Confederation for Promotion and Development, both of which provide very much needed humanitarian, economic advisory and other aid around the world. But most importantly today, and for today, I'm very grateful to Harassus organization and its truly extraordinary founder and visionary, Dr. Frank Richter, for bestowing upon me the honor of chairing and moderating this important discussion. And now it gives me an enormous pleasure to introduce my esteemed panel plenary members, distinguished plenary members, and I'll go one by one. And let's start with the lady among us, ladies and gentlemen, former Vice President and Minister of Foreign Affairs of Canada, Panama, Madame Isabel St. Malo. We don't have um, an opportunity to hear wild applause, but hopefully next time uh, when we gather live, we'll be able to hear them. Uh, also, I wanted to introduce now Honorable Minister of Economic Development of Honduras, Arnada Castillo. Mr. Castillo, thank you for joining us. Thank Honorable you for inviting me. Yes, and we also have uh, Minister uh, of Public Health of Uruguay, Minister Salinas Grasso. Sí, eh, sí, ya tengo traductora local. Yes, I already have a local traduced translator. It's a pleasure to be with you. Okay, wonderful. So. Uh, as everyone probably curated, not simply Comenzamos. have a high level perspectives from different Latin American countries, but also to have perspectives from different spheres of the country's internal and external engagements, whether it's from sphere of foreign affairs, public health, or commerce. And for this, I would like to take a moment and sincerely thank each and every one of distinguished plenary participants for so graciously accepting my personal invitation and taking time from your busy schedule to join me today for what will undoubtedly be an important and most certainly very timely discussion. So let's begin. Latin America maintains deep ties with the United States, being its fastest growing traded partner, also both share strong cultural and strategic interests. What tipping points will define the future of Latin America and what will be the impact of these tipping points on the United States policy towards the region? So before we address more detailed questions that I'll have for my plenary members, I would like to first hear from each member your overall perspectives on these important questions, perhaps by the way of relatively general introductory remarks. Minister Castillo, if you don't mind, uh, we'll start with you this time. Uh, please. Uh, yes. Uh, first of all, I uh, believe that it's an honor uh, for me to be, you know, joining this panel with um, Isabel, which I believe that we um, uh, joined a few meetings in the past uh, with uh, President Hernandez and, and, and also um, the President of Panama. Uh, an honor also, you know, to spend this panel with uh, Dr. Uh, Salinas and yourself. Um, I think that um, the relationship, if I'm going to probably not trying to kick off on the subject, you know, but um, I think that the relationship with the U.S. is very important for all Latin America at the end of the day. Uh, Honduras, Panama, and any, all the countries here, uh, have kept a pretty good relationship with uh, the U.S., and we believe that we need to strengthen this um, relationship all the ways. We have managed to uh, build a few partnerships with other countries in the region, you know, that are going to, or they 
um, are creating a platform uh, to um, create a better uh, relationship with the U.S. As an example, with the uh, North Triangle uh, countries that we have with Guatemala and also with El Salvador. Um, Honduras, uh, if we are going to talk about Honduras, um, has a relationship with the U.S. Uh, basically since uh, the 1820s, 1824, to be exact, and after we had independence in 19, uh, in 1821. So I think that um, being, or the U.S. being the largest economy in the world to our countries, um, uh, it's an opportunity at the end of the day. And it's an opportunity at, at the same time, you know, for the U.S., especially where we are located. You know, Panama itself um, provides a very strategic point for the U.S. Uh, for the or having the uh, Panama Canal, which I understand are going to go into the third phase of the expansion uh, in the near future. Uh, congratulations for that. I think that is a, a great move. Uh, but I think that the other countries at the same time, you know, have the same opportunity. So I think that um, we foresee this as a opportunity not only for each country in Latin America, Central America, but also for the U.S. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, I will now ask Minister Salinas to share with us his overall uh, opening general remarks on the subject matter, please. Muchas gracias. Este, voy a ir un poco al enfoque de lo que se refiere el contenido. Thank you very much. I'm, go I'm going to focus on the content of what. We lost voice. We cannot hear right now. It was, it was has to do with the with the American Constitution. Entonces, eh, yendo al centro de la cuestión, ¿en qué podemos interactuar y ser sinérgicos Estados Unidos y Uruguay? So le, let's think about uh, in which ways we can um, be um, uh, uh, be, se, se create synergies and um, uh, links between Uruguay and uh, America. Uh, Uruguay eh, tiene una estructura de generación en energía solar, eólica e hidráulica. Uruguay has a structure of uh, eolic, um, solar and hydraulic uh, energy. Eh, prácticamente eh, solamente el 3% de la energía del Uruguay es en base a combustibles fósiles. Only the 3% of Uruguayan um, energy is, in, is based in a fuel, uh, in fuel. Uruguay es líder en producción de energía eólica y solar y esto está respaldado por eh, la ONU. Uruguay, its leader, has the leadership in, eol in, in eolic, hydraulic, no, eolic and solar um, energy. And this is um, based on um, ONU information, United Nations information. Asimismo, eh, hay una gran oportunidad en el área de desarrollo de software. Es un gran exportador de software, el primero en América Latina per cápita. So here we identify a very big opportunity to develop software uh, to um, export as, as a way to, uh, to export uh, through the world. Más de 500 empresas internacionales de tecnología han confiado en Uruguay como proveedor de soluciones IT de alta calidad. More, more than 500 Uruguayan um, companies uh, have been um, uh, selected uh, to um, 
to provide these service solutions uh, to the world. En tanto, en, con en conectividad global, as well as in global connectivity, Uruguay ocupa el lugar sexagésimo tercero, 63. Uruguay is in the 73rd place in what has to do to global connectivity. El 85% de los hogares cuenta con acceso a banda ancha fija. 85% of, um, of, of people in Uruguay eh, ha, ha, have free access to eh, fiber optic, fiber, or, or, fiber ADSL. optic or ADSL. ADSL. Eh, en cuanto a la estrategia ambiental, Uruguay ha creado en este gobierno el Ministerio de Ambiente con un objetivo de estrategia de desarrollo sostenible 2030-2050. What has to do with uh, ambiental solutions, Uruguay has created uh, this year with this government uh, the um, Minister of, of um, eh, of, of eh, ambiental minister, mm -hmm. yes, uh, it, it was it has been created this year by the government with a very um, solid strategy that has to do with sustainable development towards the um, United Nations uh, mm -hmm. agent uh, 2030 2050. En cambio climático ha lanzado una estrategia de largo plazo. En what has to do with, cli with climate change, it has developed a, a long term de eh, strategy. De desarrollo bajo en emisiones. With low, a, a low emission strategy. Eh, a, plasmado en el Acuerdo de París. That was uh, created eh, or based in the Paris in the Paris um, in the Paris Agreement. Agreement. La industria audiovisual se ha visto beneficiada y ha tenido un gran incremento eh, internacionalmente. La producción internacional de Uruguay de producción audiovisual creciendo en agosto más del 100%. Audiovisual industry has has um, eh, eh, no. Audiovisual industry has got a very a very big eh, growth in what has in eh, in what has to has to do in, in its services and in August 2020, um, 100% of the industry was working, eh, and we have to um, consider that this was in the middle of de eh, coronavirus, ¿no? Pandemia. Eh, asimismo, pensamos que eh, en virtud de, las, de, de la potencia del sistema de salud uruguayo, considering, taking into consideration the, um, the possibilities or the strength that the, the uh, health system has in Uruguay, eh, Uruguay se podría constituir en un importante hub de servicios médicos y eso es una oportunidad para interactuar con Estados Unidos. Uruguay could be considered as a very important hub of medical services and we think that this is a very big and interesting and important opportunity to create this um, the link with the United States. Uruguay tiene historia clínica electrónica, tiene transmisión de imagenología a través de la historia clínica y está en vías de crear la receta digital. We have electronic clinical electronical clinical history y la receta electrónica digital and a digital digital prescription as well we also have imagine imaginology 
And? Eh, y, no, es eso. Y, no. Eh, bueno, y en cuanto a la pandemia, ha, ha podido desarrollar el país con sus técnicos. And uh, taking into consideration the, pan, the coronavirus pandemic. Test diagnósticos de PCR en tiempo real. We have developed uh, diagno diagnosis tests of PCR in real time. Eh, re, se realiza una vigilancia epidemiológica. Epidemiol we, also, we have also developed um, um, epidemiologic vigilance. Eh, a través de secuenciación genómica. Through uh, genomic sequenciation. Eh, asimismo, hemos puesto en marcha un plan de vacunación. As well, we started a very ambitious for Uruguay, in Uruguayan terms, a very ambitious uh, vaccinating plan eh, contra el coronavirus against coronavirus desde el primero de marzo from the first, from the first day of March 2020 y estamos no, 2021, sorry 21. yes y hemos alcanzado el día de hoy en, en, 20, en 18 días al 9% And we have reached in 18, only 18 days, 19, 9%, 9 of the population objective. of the objective population that has received uh, his or her its vaccine. Minister Salinas, my apologies. I'm just afraid we will run out of time and not everybody will have a chance to participate. But I very much appreciate this update. And I see also former Minister of Foreign Affairs of Ecuador, Mr. Gallegos joined us. Can you hear us well? See us well? Yes, I can hear you very well. Lovely, lovely. Thank you for joining us. Very happy to see this. So, Madam Vice President, if I may ask you for perhaps two, three minutes uh, general remarks uh, on the overall topic before we jump in into conversation. Sure. Thank you so much, um, Stephen, for, for the introduction and thank you, Horacis, for the invitation. My Greetings to the rest of the panelists. Minister uh, Gallegos, I believe we met uh, briefly when I was in, in Ecuador for the general elections uh, a while ago, and I would like to thank Minister Castillo uh, for, for mentioning the Panama Canal and what it is for, for the region. Uh, briefly, uh, Stephen, Latin America is not only a, a very strong trading partner to the United States, but we are also the United States' next-door neighbor. So what happens in Latin America or does not happen in Latin America clearly impacts the United States in, in a variety of, of areas. We can mention migration, of course, which is at the top uh, of mind of, of the media and, and, and society in the United States right now. But we can also mention uh, illegal drug trafficking, crime, illegal activity in general. And I believe that to have a plan, to have a structure, prepared roadmap for dealing with Latin America, it's crucial to the new administration. Fortunately for the region, President Biden knows the region very well. He, as a vice president, uh, led many efforts uh, with the region, and I, I am sure that that will facilitate the process, but I will just like before ending mention what COVID-19 has meant to Latin America because I also believe that this needs to be at the core of whichever plan the United States has for the region. And the fact is that even though Latin America has only 9% of the population in the world, we have had, we have had uh, uh, 20% of the cases of COVID-19 now in the world and we've had 30% of the deaths. So what does this mean? This means that Pre-existing uh, problems and issues that we already has have surfaced with the pandemic, and it is very important that we address them uh, right now. And our partners, like the United States, can be important players in addressing our efforts for reconstruction and for overcoming the uh, challenges of, of the pandemic and the challenges that we have in general and that were there before. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Vice President. And uh, Mr. Galakos, again, thank you for joining us. So maybe uh, you could be so kind to share your general 
uh, introductory remarks. Again, also two, three minutes, please. Thank you very much, Madam Vice President. It's a pleasure. Uh, and yes, we, we, we have met. Uh, thank you for the invitation. I agree with what Madam Vice President has just said. I think the COVID issue is, um, or we all get out of this or no one gets out of this. So the, 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 the crisis we have on our hands is the major, not only health issue, economic issue, but social issue that we have that has aggravated the poverty of the region, has made it very, has made an impact that will decrease our normal economic uh, growth and uh, our decrease, according to uh, to the Latin American Commission on Economic and Social Affairs, will be between 12 to 9 percent. So the, the impact of this will, will uh, aggravate poverty, inequity, and we have social strife as a consequence. So uh, uh, we need that this partnership be a, a strengthened partnership in economic advantages with capacities of being able to, uh, to uh, access markets, to access resources, to work jointly on, on the issues that we have together as problems. Amongst them, of course, security issues because of the drug. Narco trafficking is one of our principal security issues in the region. Uh, uh, and Ecuador is one of the victims of this, uh, uh, of this, uh, uh, of this um, business, which I would call very, uh, very billion dollar business. Uh, but also we, we, we have deal with issues of corruption, issues of demo, uh, uh, challenging democ democratic institutions, and uh, building a regional integration that can be a, a strengthening of all partners, being able to join together in solving the problems, and being a, a region which can offset in part the, the structures that are being created both in Asia and in Europe as, uh, as a nucleus of a, of a one market, that can compete in those in, in those regions in 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 a uh, in a broader sense. Uh, I think we have uh, under President Biden, who I also agree knows the region very well, uh, an opportunity of growing multilaterally. Since the last administration, unfortunately, didn't believe in that. I believe that multilateral strengthening of the region will benefit all of us and benefit all our peoples. Development, prosperity, freedom, democracy are the objectives of this uh, of this venture. Thank you, Minister. Uh, speaking of multilateral engagement, I actually would like to continue with this theme. And um, it seems to me that before we could have a meaningful discussion about the relationship and the future of Latin America and the United States, we first need to address what, in my opinion, is one of the most fundamental issues in the relationship. And that is a lack of unified, coherent initiatives, you know, joint efforts, and therefore lack of perhaps unified voice. In fact, this morning, I had a wonderful uh, fire chat discussion with the president, Chan Satoki of Suriname. And he told me that it seems like almost each country within Latin America is out for itself. You know, something he's very much hopes to see change and is able and willing to do his part to make this happen. So just to continue on this theme, uh, Minister Gallegos, I wanted to ask you, I, I know you were working quite closely with your counterparts within Latin America. Do you think it will be possible to have the necessary or, if you will, maybe increased level of unification of agenda and therefore voice when it comes to Latin America as a whole? And can these barriers be removed? I think they can, but we, we, we confront the Latin America situation, which has been um, a, a, uh, a sense of irritation for all, for all partners. And that has to deal with the Venezuelan crisis. We have a democratic crisis in Venezuela. We have an economic crisis. We've had uh, five and a half million Venezuelans leave Venezuela, which has caused a major humanitarian uh, problem for the region never saw, never seen before. Uh, we have received uh, in Ecuador more than half a million, and this, as you as you slice this pie in different parts, uh, both Colombia, Peru, Chile, and all of them and uh, have increased numbers of, uh, of Venezuelan migrants, uh, which, can, uh, which are fleeing the humanitarian crisis in Venezuela. Why, if Venezuela does not solve its democratic problem, I do not believe that there will, uh, there will be a, a, a viable integration in the region. It's very difficult for uh, those of us who are trying to solve uh, uh, Fight Venezuela to have a democratic process of returning to democratic institutions to deal with these problems. 
But that brings along uh, uh, a, a division amongst the, the Latin Americans who see this problem in different ways. And that has also created a, a division amongst the region. Uh, we need to unify those positions, have a consensus on, on, on what we can do together to aid our, our Venezuelan brothers to achieve that democracy and solve the humanitarian problems that they are dealing with. Uh, I believe that that, uh, accompanied by other issues, which I have just mentioned at the beginning, uh, add to the, uh, the, to the complexity of the problem. Uh, it is not an easy problem to solve. Uh, it has accompanied us for, for, for many a time. And that has brought uh, an ideological barrier between the different groups that look at the solution to the problem from different angles. Uh, I, I always, I'm a diplomat. I believe in consensus building. I believe in dialogue. And I think the capacity of doing that uh, with, with a, a strength that, that, that can join the dialogue with all of them is what we are looking for in the region. Uh, I really hope that that, that can be achieved. Mr. Gallegos, thank you very much. I, I appreciate this perspective. Uh, Madam Vice President, I want to come back to you. Uh, it seems to me that the lack of unified voice within Latin America, in my opinion, triggers this corresponding suboptimal policies from the United States towards and that impact the region. More specifically, it appears that U.S. policies address individual countries, and in some cases, maybe even subregions, but not really holistically uh, the region as a whole. I know you've been heavily involved in efforts to analyze this core issue and try to come up with some solutions. And you did it with a great group of other uh, former high-ranking officials from various countries within Latin America. And I know you specifically looked at, we talked about President, President Biden and his policies, and I know your group specifically looked and analyzed President Biden's plan of actions that deal with the region. And first of all, again, thank you for sharing that report with me uh, before. It was actually very powerful indeed. Uh, and the report actually made it very clear that there's a lot of room for improvement in President Biden's policy. So I know there are many items, and again, we all function within limited time and resources, right? But maybe within a few minutes, could you please um, elaborate and share with us um, to the extent possible uh, briefly, just some of the findings and recommendations made by this great group? Sure. Um, this is a group of uh, mostly Central Americans. We gather together to analyze President Biden's proposal for the Northern Triangle, uh, Honduras, uh, uh, Guatemala, and El Salvador. And um, one of the things that we proposed is the importance of looking at Central America as a region, because with the region is connected problems are shared within the countries. And, and one of the proposals was, was that, to look at the region in a holistic fashion. If we're going to talk about foreign direct investment, for example, which is very important for Latin America in general, for Central America, for sure, um, we are small countries. Any foreign investor that is going to come to our countries needs to look to the region. And if we're able to analyze the synergies the complementarity that we have, and and going again back to to the Panama Canal, that needs to represent an opportunity not only for Panama, but for Panama and the rest of the countries within the region when it is looked at the, as a perspective from foreign direct um, investment. But I would like to to go back, Stephen, to your mention of. Latin America divided, and, and I believe that it's true, we have been quite inefficient at trying to have a coherent voice and coherent positions within Latin America and within Central America as well. I, need, we need to, I think we need to look at our coincidences. We will always have differences, and the differences are legitimate. We are all entitled to have our own position, but there are some things that we share. We share the risks of climate change. We share the, the issues of poverty and inequality in all of our countries. We share uh, weakened institutions. If we are able to come together to work against our weaknesses and setting aside our differences, I think that is a much faster track than trying to concentrate on eliminating our differences. I agree with what Minister Gallegos has said in terms of uh, 
what the Venezuelan situation represents in terms of ideological confrontation or ideological differences. But I believe we need to be able to rise above that and put, put at the core our, our objectives as a region, our, which, are, which, is, which are our people. And I believe that we need to separate as well our relationship with our partners, such as the United States and others, and put that above and separate from whatever difference we have within the region. I think that it's long overdue that we revise um, our efforts in that in that sense and in our efforts within our own countries as well. We've, we've worked uh, with, a, with UNDP, you talked about multilateral institutions and, and health consultations last year. And the region needs to build a new social contract within our countries and among our countries. I think that is uh, a task that we need to address. Thank you. Madam Vice President, uh, uh, very thoughtful uh, perspective, and again, tremendous work of the group. Uh, Minister Castillo, big, back to you. Uh, it is clear that well-being of Latin America and the United States are very interconnected, uh, as Madam Vice President pointed out, and there are many issues that exist in Latin America that have direct impact on the United States. Flight of people and resulting immigration issues for the United States, drug trafficking, which takes a big toll for both countries, you know, both regions, and so on and so forth. And elevation of social and economic well-being of people in Latin America is most certainly a pathway to resolving many of the causes of the problem in the region and beyond, of course. And creation of quality jobs, better education for population, especially, by the way, for the future generation of Latin America, the young people, so they have a sense of belonging, confidence about their country and future of their countries, right? So uh, for this to happen, I know many Latin American countries try to make themselves more attractive for direct investments. During my previous conversations with you and seeing your tremendous work, Minister, um, I was actually very, very impressed with, with, with what I saw in terms of internal efforts and changes being undertaken in Honduras. Uh, Minister Castillo, do you mind sharing with us uh, some of the examples of these efforts and how you see these efforts facilitating a stronger and more stable region? as well as stronger and more stable relationship with the United States? Yeah, I think that we have a lot of uh, challenges, as you just mentioned, immigration, the drug trafficking, you know, um, which, by the way, you know, we are not producers of, of drugs, but at the end of the day, you know, the um, there is a path of death in Honduras because of that. Um, I think that we, we've been building a lot of efforts, uh, with the United States, I think that, um, and actually with President Biden uh, and President Hernandez, you know, they have this initiative of the North Triangle countries. Uh, and try to ended up, you know, with all the countries in Central America. But I think that um, if we go back to some of the numbers and we go back to the uh, FDI, in particular, you know, uh, 2018, we have um, a decline of the FDI, especially from the U.S. to Honduras. So I think that it, there is something that either Honduras is not doing well, that we are not selling the country, you know, in the right way, or... There is something that the American investors are not seeing. So, and the reason that I say that is because uh, I will say that probably in 2017 and 2018, we had a trade deficit with Taiwan, as an example. But um, I came into office in 2016, and basically in two years, you know, we had a positive trade uh, balance with Taiwan. We increased our trade balance with Europe uh, as Honduras. You know, I'm, I'm not talking about, you know, the other countries. So I think that either there is a lack of information, a lack of our teams uh, in the region, you know, trying to sell our countries, or there is something that, you know, um, again, you know, the investors in the U.S. are not seeing. Uh, we think that um, the U.S. can benefit with, uh, you know, with this relationship at the end of the day. 
Right now, a lot of factories are closing down in, in China and some other countries in Asia. Why don't we, you know, build up that um, infrastructure and become, you know, better partners uh, by investing, creating jobs. Uh, and, you know, it's not only U.S. investment, but, you know, investment from our own uh, people here in Honduras, we can probably eliminate the immigration to the U.S., uh, we can probably have more opportunities. So the drug trafficking that is also affecting the U.S. Uh, big time uh, can lower the numbers. So I think that, you know, we have a lot of opportunities. Uh, the challenges are there. We always had these challenges, but at the end of the day, we need to uh, work as a team. Honduras and Guatemala uh, build up uh, what we call the uh, Customs Union which basically after whatever Europe has, uh, we have the, the only two countries in the world that you can uh, bring some uh, goods into Guatemala, pay the taxes there, bring it to Honduras, and then it's like you make customs you know, in Honduras, the other way around. So, you know, examples like that, we can build up with the U.S. Examples like that we can build up here in Central America as well that are going to benefit, you know, our countries and can uh, at the same time, you know, benefit uh, the U.S. Yes. Uh, thank you, Minister Castillo. I think you touched upon the real heart of the issue. Uh, I think, uh, and I could tell you over the years when discussing with country leaders their political economic aspirations, I also keep noticing this disconnect between the aspirations and opportunities on one side with all the hard work that takes place within the country to make it more attractive. And on the other hand, you know, the effective and timely, which is very important communication of these opportunities and interest to the United States and other uh, potential investors and, and counterparties. Uh, and to do that in the format that is timely and productive. Um, so, and again, the format has to effectively broker bilateral and multilateral interests in the same time. So you're right. I mean, it's really not about you build it and they will come. That's not the model that that works. Um, and look, there is new administration in the United States. And therefore, with every new administration, there are always new set of opportunities lie ahead. But it's for those who are positioned and well represented, take advantage of them. So, yes, uh, very on point. Thank you, Minister Castillo. Uh, and I wanted to come back uh, to Minister Salinas, if I may. <clears throat> Uh, you touched upon the major pandemic, and of course, this is uh, your world as a minister of health. And uh, COVID-19 took a big toll on nations around the world. And it also uncovered major weaknesses, not only internal uh, country crisis management system, but also when it comes to international cooperation and joint, joint initiatives. And me and you talked about this in the past also. So as a public health minister, uh, do you see any hope for better coordination of disaster responses in the region and in co or cooperation with the United States? And practically speaking, what should be done to make this happen? Uh, we only have about three minutes, please. Thank you. Definitely, we agree in en que es necesaria una coordinación internacional y concretamente de la región americana en su conjunto. We agree, frente... yes. sí. We agree that, that definitely it is, it is very important a Latin American coordination between countries y eh, con Norteamérica también as well as with North America para la respuesta coordinada de situaciones de crisis y emergencia. In order to respond um, well to any situation of emergency and crisis as the pandemic occurs. No, no solamente crisis eh, de amenaza biológica, sino de pronto también problemas geográficos naturales como terremotos, eh, volcanes, en fin. Hay que estar preparados desde el punto de vista biológico, la amenaza biológica, los sismos y terremotos y volcanes. En definitiva, siempre tener un 
equipo de reserva americano para dar respuesta a situaciones de crisis variada con diferentes tipos de especialistas en, en, estas, en estas diferentes áreas. We have to uh, consider not only biologic threats, but also natural disasters and coordinate or be in coordination, work in coordination with American teams in order to, uh, to uh, have a good response to these threats, like volcanoes, uh, uh, seismic, uh, seismic uh, Move. movements, or any, or any tsunamis or any other natural disaster that we have to uh, face. Yo creo que lo más importante the most important thing here, the core, es generar is, un equipo de gente que tenga respuestas anticipadas frente a problemas diversos. Es to generate a coordinated team that can respond before uh, the uh, situation comes. Es una especie de estado mayor coordinador para situaciones de desastre. Es una kind of a great state coordinator in order to respond to uh, disasters. Esto permitiría to be prepared to respond to these disasters. This would allow que la respuesta fuera inmediata. It would allow to have an immediate response y previamente estudiada, que es lo importante. Previ previously studied and planificated. Eso es la idea fuerza que se puede desprender de esta reunión. This is the core idea of what I would like to uh, say here. Y por supuesto la colaboración y las ocasiones de inversión directa real en, en este mercado emergente and of course the importance of the investment the collaboration in this uh, emergent um, this emergent uh, market. market y así podremos contribuir al progreso de todas las naciones que constituimos la gran américa so as we can contribute to all the nations that create or that form the big americas Mr. Galagos, thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, there is never enough time for these types of conversations, but I think this was very productive and meaningful. And on behalf of Harasses, over 100 global leaders, as well as other event participants who gathered with us today, I just wanted to thank each and every one of you for what has been a very important and certainly very timely conversation. And I also wanted to thank everyone else who attended this plenary. There are many more discussions that are timely and important that Dr. Richter prepared for you as part of this extraordinary meeting on the United States of America. So stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. I'm Stephen Melnick of globalpoliticalandbusinessdiplomacy.org. I'm wishing you an enjoyable and productive remainder of this truly extraordinary meeting. Wish you well to everyone. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Thank you again. Bye.